Good evening. I'm gonna, uh, I think the last few people are grabbing their food and we're yeah. still waiting a few more people, but I'm Mayor Lucy Venice and I want to thank you again for investing your time and your energy and your skills to come and be a critical part of this conversation, which is uh, immensely important to us. Council is waiting to hear what you have to say in just another month or so. And uh, I know it's I know it's a heavy lift for a lot of people at the end of a long working day um, in the middle of the week to make the time for this. So I very much appreciate you coming back, doing this hard work. I think today is the session that we are all sort of have been building towards where uh, it feels like the rubber really hits the road. So I look forward to hearing your conversation and thank you again for your dedication to our community and the work that you are doing for us. And I will turn it over to Anne. Thank you. I'm Anne Fifield, project manager for this project, City of Eugene. And I want to reiterate what the mayor said. Thank you for being here. We know this is a lot of your time. We know this is hard work. It's not a lot of fun. It's messy. A lot of this work is very <coughs> messy. And please have patience as we all learn together and go through this. It's uh, I'm very optimistic that it's going to be a difficult conversation over the next two meetings. But it, um, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. <laughs> Probably a terrible metaphor. <laughs> um, and then uh, let's see. I want to acknowledge there's a lot of language that is jargony. It's complex. It's confusing. There's no way around it. It's jargony, it's complex, it's confusing. And one thing that we really want to clarify, because it is hard to have a conversation about affordable housing and housing affordability. It's just hard to have the conversation. Um, for the purposes of this group, just so we all have a shared vocabulary, so we don't have to have a 20 minute conversation every time we try to talk about a type of housing, we have generally said, Affordable housing means housing that is designed explicitly for very low, low-income households. It's typically subsidized by government or a nonprofit agency, and it's income qualified. That's affordable housing with a capital A, affordable. Just trying to make it so it's clear that's what we're talking about. Housing affordability is for all income levels. All households want housing that's affordable. If you earn a million dollars a year and you live in San Francisco, rumor has it, it's hard to find a house that's affordable. And so it depends. It's housing affordability is when we're referring to housing that is affordable to households across the income spectrum. There's a lot of nuance and little details in there, but just generally, that's where we are. This process is looking at both, but it's primarily focused on housing affordability across the income spectrum. That includes households that are very low income and it includes households up to the top of the income spectrum that they're less likely to have housing affordability issues, but it's across the whole income spectrum. That's what we're focused on here in this process, the whole income spectrum. And then there's a lot of other language, the jargony things, there's acronyms like SDCs and urban UGB for the urban growth boundary. They're confusing. We have some of them in a glossary, not all of them. We've worked hard to keep the explanations simple and understandable. When you don't understand something, raise your hand and say, hey, can somebody explain this to me? We've got a lot of staff here who can help explain things. We're all gonna kind of be hovering around and hoping to help explain things to the best that we can. Do, please ask questions when you don't understand what a word means. That's what staff is here for. And with that, and with so that. Care. <laughs> Carrie. Thank you. Uh, I'm Carrie Bennett. I'm your facilitator. It's my job to kind of hold the space for you to do your best thinking together, um, to help enforce our group norms. Um, and audience members, you have group norms over there as well. You can check out to help us collectively do our best thinking together. Today's going to be super exciting. Um, city staff has been gearing up and supporting this work. Um, we have our housing economist who's going to come and bring a bunch of really relevant data to help you all. 
I'm sure some of you will leave still hungry for more data, and we're going to do our best to meet those needs. Um, but it should be a really exciting day. Before we jump into our check-in, you got a folder today, because as we looked at the amount of information that we were going to dump on you, we said, holy cow, <laughs> how are we going to manage all this? So let's do a quick tour of what's in your folders so everybody knows what's there. On the left side, there's an agenda. I'm going to tell you what's in it. Should be some of this familiar now. We'll do some welcome and grounding. We're going to talk about the grown zone, because we're going to spend some time there today, and that's OK. Um, we're going to talk about what's happened since we last met. And then the bulk of the meeting today is going to be all about deepening your understanding. Last time you guys brainstormed a ton of options. We've expanded on those, clarified some of those. Um, you'll see what those are. And we just really need to wrestle with what does that actually mean? What would it look like? Who would benefit from that? Who might feel disadvantaged from that? So we're really going to be just wrapping our heads around what might that look like. Um, and at the end, we'll do a temperature check. This is not a final vote. It's just to see which way is the wind blowing on some of these, which ideas are kind of rising to the top, which ideas don't seem to have any weight, and the mix of everything in between, right? We'll do that, and then we'll wrap up at the end, do our closing and next steps. Um, it's going to be fast today, and it's going to be fast before we're back in this room again, um, having our final conversation and coming up with that final list to council. All right, so that's your agenda. Behind the agenda is your notes from last time, photos of all of that content, the next page is your participant evaluation, how you felt about all the different chunks of the meeting and feedback. Kudos to whoever came up with the non-dairy Sunday bar. It's got us thinking about how we're going to celebrate at the next one. Uh, so appreciate that suggestion. Sorry it didn't happen yet for today. I don't know who that was, but I love the way you think. Um, I'm going for full dairy myself, but we'll try to accommodate. Um, and then the last page on that left side is community feedback. You remember that there's that portal online where folks can um, respond after they've reviewed the materials and weigh in. Um, so you can see we um, got feedback this time um, from two different folks, and you can see a summary of their information. All right? If folks are interested, audience members in particular, you see the website um, that has all of your products as well as our professionally made videos of all of this fun, which is such a, a tremendous resource, um, is all on that website. Um, and that's where people can uh, give their feedback on the form from what we talk about today before our next meeting. Anybody think more people are going to weigh in <laughs> on the next one? I think so too. I think people have just been waiting. They're like, ah, here's a whole bunch of ideas. So it'll be fun to see what they say. All right, on the right side, that'll be the chunk, or this will be all the content that we will wrestle with. This is most of what you got. I think you got nearly everything except the final pages. Um, in the email from Jason reminding you about today. So hopefully some of that looks familiar. It's color-coded to help make life easier on our brains. <laughs> We're gonna tackle those one at a time. Um, and then at the end you'll see there's the place where we'll do our temperature check and you'll weigh in on what you think about those different options as well as an evaluation. All right, feeling good? All right, I think it's time to check in then. You hopefully spent some time when you first got here Thinking back on your interests, they're behind this board, um, but you've got them in your packet. Sorry, that was really the first front page of the right side. I forgot I had taken mine out of my folder. Hopefully you have circled your top two or three, and now this is really hard. I need you to put a star by your top number one, recognizing it is impossible, but you can do it anyway. When you think about the solutions that you will want to put forward to council, what are, what's most important to you in a potential solution? So your check-in today is going to be real brief. I got some feedback. You didn't like talking about what you were missing. That's fine. Um, we'll talk about you. I want you to just say your name, if there's an organization you're affiliated with or representing here, and what your top interest is. I'm going to keep a tally of them here. Okay, so we can kind of see which ones rise to the top, but you'll get a sense for yourself in listening, and those will feed into our criteria of how we'll collectively evaluate these. All of the interests are important, right? And even if you're the only one who thinks one of them is like the top number one thing, that's fine. But we can, again, get a sense of the will of the group of which one of these are most important. All right, I would like to start with whoever's ready. And then if you're sitting next to that person, heads up. <laughs> the microphone's coming to you. All right. 
Uh, I'm Tiffany Edwards. I'm uh, with the Eugene Chamber of Commerce, and I put the number 16 at my top, meeting community needs and desires and support to thrive here. Perfect. Pass it along, Tiffany. I'm Eliza Kaczynski. I'm with We Can, the Walkable Eugene Citizen Advisory Network, and I put number 32, sustainability and long-term thinking. Thank you, Eliza. My name is Norton Cabell. I'm on the Intergovernmental Housing Policy Board. I chose number six, people and housing solutions that work. Thank you, Norton. I'm Pat Hawken, representing the League of Women Voters, and I chose number four, healthy, safely housed citizens. Thank you. Carolyn Jacobs, I'm a member of the Neighborhood Leaders Council. I chose number 23, livability, places people want to live. Awesome, thank you. Mel Bankoff, Partners for Sustainable Schools and Developer, and I chose Equity because I think everything cascades from there. Okay, number 11, if you're keeping your own tally, you get to pass it off to whoever. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron Bevert, uh, Neighborhood Leadership Council uh, representative. Um, I don't know which of these. Um, I think the thing that I feel is most important is figuring out how we can fund affordable housing. So let's come back because I want to have a tally. Think about which one of these fits the, the funding piece. I don't know off the top of my head, but we'll come back to you and I want a number if you can. <laughs> Go ahead, Caleb. Uh, my name is Caleb Peterson and I went with 21, which is inclusivity of all residents. Thank you, Caleb. Dan Hill, Arbor South Architecture and Arbor South Construction. Uh, I went also with uh, 23 uh, livability places that people want to be. Thank you. Ed McMahon, Home Builders Association. I went with six people and housing solutions that work. Thank you, Ed. Back to Ted. Um, <laughs> I'm Dick Hoopman, and I'm a, a, a Neighborhood Leaders Council, one of our reps. And um, I was pretty close on a lot of these. I'm like, oh yeah, it was like number two or number three. But I'd have to go for respect for diverse values and needs. Okay, which number is that? I'm sorry, that's number 31. 31, thank you. I'm Jacob Fox from the Homes for Good Housing Agency, and I'm choosing number four, healthy, safely house citizens. Thank you, Jacob. Lisa Fragola. Um, educator and member of the City of Eugene Planning Commission. I chose number 32, sustainability and long-term thinking. Thank you, Lisa. Deborah Daly, homeless liaison for the Eugene Fort J School District. And I chose number 10, helping, compassion, and practicality. Okay, good. Claudia Orozco with Latino Network Professionals, resident, a realtor. Anywho, I chose Eight, number 18, diversity. Thank you. My name is Roman Anderson with Kimball Construction, and I chose number 24, partnership, public, private, all working together. Thank you, Roman. My name is Alyssa Powell. I'm with Palo Alto Software and Eugene Young Professionals, and I also have selected number 24. Betsy Schultz, Government Affairs Director for the Eugene Association of Realtors, and I picked number six, People in Housing Solutions at Work. Dan Delaney, Burks and Delaney Architecture, and I also chose number six. Uh, Dan Straub, uh, Tokadi Capital Management Development Company, and I was original and picked number six as well. <laughs> I was original. I was worried that we weren't going to have any congruence of anything. I'm all for diversity, but it's nice when we can find something we have in common. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm John Van Landingham. I'm a legal aid lawyer, affordable housing advocate, and former planning commission, and I too chose number six. Thank you. My name is Regina Perry, and I work at Legal Aid, and I also chose number six. Thank you, Regina. My name's Amy Bradbury, and I work for the City of Eugene in Planning and Development, and I chose 16. Oh, no, I know, I'm going to get kicked <laughs> off my table. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Uh, my name's Typer Zimmerman. I'm with the Active Bethel Citizens, and I'm on the Eugene Budget Committee. I circled as one of my top three number six, yes, <laughs> but What's my number song? one was number 17, Justice and Fairness. Thank you. Chris Parra, Superintendent Bethel School District, and I chose number six. Thank you. Terry Harding, Eugene Planning and Development. 
number 11, equity. Thank you. Isaac, you're next. Isaac, and then we're going to come back to Ron and see. Yep. Yep, we get him. I haven't had a chance to look Oh, yeah. It, so Do it. I just walked in. <laughs> Isaac, could you please just pull out your most important value from a list of 32 things in 2.2 seconds? We're going to come back to you. <laughs> Ron, were you able to narrow it down to one? I have to pick one of these numbers. Uh-huh. I don't know. I was As I was listening to other people, I heard, um, I wondered if compassion and which one was that? Um, Number 10, helping compassion practicality, like um, if, you're, if you're interested in paying for um, capital A affordable housing and getting people into houses in that way, I wonder if that might, I don't know. Number 30, shared responsibility. How are you gonna pay for it? Everybody kind of has a, a dollar in the fight. <laughs> Seems to be popular, but I, you know. <laughs> we can come back to. We can. We'll come back. We'll get take some time. So here's here's what, what what did you all notice as you listened to those? Aside from number six, seemed popular for a while. They were all awesome. Right? This gets us back to the wicked problem, right? Of we want all of all the things, and we remind ourselves that there are trade offs, right? Um, so there was a lot of really good ideas, and it's hard to choose just one. Um, when we think about evaluating your options, one of the steps in our process is defining criteria that says what's a good idea and what's not a good idea for our city. And there's certain things that we may not agree on. But there's, there's several things that I think we can. Um, one is that things have to be legal, <laughs> or at least that there's mechanisms to change the laws if it's not currently legal, right? So the one about um, selling bonds, right, was dependent on what happened with Measure 102. That passed, so that one now fits the definition of legal, right? Prior to that measure passing, it may not have, right? Because um, there wasn't a mechanism. Um, second, is your criteria from uh, city council. They want things that are going to increase the availability, the affordability, and the diversity of housing in Eugene. So your city council is saying, hey, give us solutions that fit with this. There are some options on your list that are brilliant ideas that may not directly impact some of these. Okay? It doesn't mean they're not brilliant ideas, it doesn't mean they shouldn't be implemented in one form or another, but we want to be mindful of they may not be perfectly aligned with this specific goal. Okay? Um, our other ones is that it meets as many of our interests as possible. So what I heard and what I tallied, uh oh, where did my magic sheet go? Um, that people in housing and solutions that work matter. Okay, so whether that's through increasing supply and having more afford more availability, whether it's through um, investing in things that that just makes it more affordable, um, or if diversity is a part of that solution, that having people in houses matters to to a large chunk of this group. Okay. Um, other things that had at least two votes, healthy, safely housed citizens, equity, meeting the community needs, livability, places people want to live, and partnerships. Oh, and then sustainability. Those all at least had two votes. How many of you would like say, yeah, I want more of all of these things, right? It's hard to just pick one, right? So those ones that kind of rose to the top, we're going to want to keep in mind, okay? But again, we want to get as many of these as possible. When you're arguing your points later today, I would challenge you to use the use this language to say, hey, you know, this to me really fits number six, right? To me, that's an, that's something that says, hey, more people are going to be able to move in homes and be safe, um, and that sounds like something that'll work. Somebody else might say, uh, oh, but it doesn't meet my interest of whatever number, okay? Sure, number four. Six was the big one, 11, 16, 
23, 24, and 32. Patricia, was that your question or is something else? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I think that what that actually means will be worth exploring in your conversation, right? So when you look at one of the options, when you look, when you read it, you'll want to do that gut check for yourself and say, so in my mind, that sounds like it'll work because, but da da da, right? So what that actually means, I think, will come out of your conversation, right? And and what will work? Um, you'll hear from Sarah tonight, there's, there is no one sil single silver bullet that's going to solve all of this, right? It's going to take a combination of these things, and even then your solutions might be imperfect, but how do we, how do we improve the balance, right? One more. I guess when I'm aware of when I look at this, I guess when I'm aware of when I look at this, I can pull up any one of them, and all the rest of them are interconnected. Sure. Sure, yeah. These, in this, that's why we don't want to spend you know, too much time delving into, well, this or well, that, like the interconnection of them and, and also the way people define them, right, is, is going to be very different. What, what livability means to one person and what livability means to a different person um, could, be, could be, have different interpretations. So, good. Um, so let's remind ourselves of where we're at in the process. Um, this is kind of our roadmap. We spent a lot of time talking about the story in our first two meetings. Some of you were chomping at the bit because you're like, let's talk about solutions. <laughs> but this is the way that we understood the problem together. Last time you identified your interests, and that's the list we were just looking at, and you brainstormed options. There will be times today in your small group with it where if there's new options that you've thought of that aren't on that list, you can add them. I hope there won't be like a giant flood because let me tell you, y'all did some really good work already. <laughs> um, but I know that there are some other really good ideas that might come up today, and that's fine. We'll add them. Okay. Um, we have just discussed some of our criteria. That's kind of like our spaghetti strainer that says what defines what gets caught and that we hold on to and like, and what ideas are we going to have to let pass through. Okay. Um, today we are going to spend more time delving into what those options actually look like, understanding them better, and weighing them against our criteria. Saying how does this meet those criteria or not. A little bit of today is straw design that says, what if we this, thank you, Jason, what if we that, right? Just kind of experimenting before you have to get to number six there, <laughs> um, which is our ultimate agreement and implementation. All right, so we'll think about that, like trying some things on. You're not committed to buying anything. You're not stuck with your votes today, um, but it's just kind of testing out what combination of things might work. All right, here's why today's going to be hard. Real briefly, I don't want to belabor this because it's kind of facilitator mumbo jumbo that not as, not everybody gets excited about, but Jason, could you stick that up somewhere for me? <coughs> Sometimes groups struggle at this phase of a process and it doesn't feel very good. When we start out, this is in your handbook if you are wanting to follow along, I can't remember what page, but you'll see the same graphic. When we start out with a problem, we often have a solution that we think, yes, if we would just do this, it'll solve it, right? And we start exploring, and we start figuring out new things, and it's like, oh, all of a sudden this idea that I thought would be our answer is more complex than that, or that may not work, or that has these drawbacks I didn't think of, or it's not the only answer, right? Eventually, as we broadened all these ideas, we have to get to a solution <laughs> that we can work with. So we take all the millions of possibilities and all the complexity of it all, and we have to narrow it down again for a list that we can send off to your city council and say, hey, this community of people recommends these things. The turning point in between these two is hard. <laughs> it's hard because we have to let go of the one idea that we thought was really brilliant from the get-go. It's hard because some of us just love when all the possibilities are on the table and we don't like to have to give up some ideas that we thought were good. For some people, it's hard spending all the time on the front end, and they just want to get to the solutions. So there's tensions in that. Um, but what, we're, what you're going to wrestle with today, and this is, this is called the groan zone. This is from Sam Kaner, who is um, a masterful facilitator in uh, the Bay Area. 
Um, and, and this is a sign when you're in the midst of this as you're trying to round that corner to really evaluate things and come up with your top solution. It can feel awful because it's complex, it's overwhelming, there's a million different reasons. It's not a sign you're doing it wrong, it's a sign you're doing it right, okay? So when you feel that today and you're like, it's okay, it means we're doing it right. <laughs> um, some, t some tips to help get you through the grown zone, patience. Hey, if you can put on an extra pair of your patient's pants today. <laughs> um, persistence to get through it. Say this is hard, but we're gonna do it. We're gonna get to that other side. And the third um, element I invite you to bring in is curiosity, okay? Assume that of all of these things, the best ideas will surface, but if we're gonna do this working together, we've gotta be curious about one another's perspectives, okay? With our consensus model, the way you're gonna be most impactful with getting people to support your ideas is showing them how that idea meets their interests. Okay, it's not just, this is a brilliant idea because, it's this is a good idea for what's important to you and this is how it can help what's important to you. Okay, so bring that spirit of curiosity so you can understand those values that are important to your um, fellow working group members and we'll, we'll hold that space to help each other through the grown zone. By the end, <laughs> at the end of the day on the 28th, I'm gonna be exhausted. You all are gonna be even more exhausted because you're definitely working harder than I am. Um, but we will have a list that we're gonna to send to council. Here's what it's gonna look like. Oh yeah, there we are. Gonna feel good. Um, here's the update since we last met and then we're gonna get into, um, I think our market study and the details for today. At the last meeting, you guys brainstormed a whole bunch of options. You put dots by the things that you wanted to learn more about. It was awesome. I went home that night and I furiously typed and typed and typed and typed and made a whole list compiled with the dots. I started chunking them by, okay, these things all seem to be related to land use code. These are like financial, helping get people off the ground. This was like a three page, four page, I don't know how long it was, okay? But that was just typing up from your notes. From there, it went through another iteration. We, I sat around with city staff the day after and we said, well, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? What would that option look like? And that's how we landed at the document that you have now, which is all of those options. It has changed a lot. And let me show you part of how. This is just an example of one of your ideas from before. It is in community speak, which is my language. <laughs> Y'all are my people. This is how we talk as community members. The flip side of that is what does it actually mean to implement it? And that's city speak call it generally. It's statutory language, it's dense, it's really, really specific. What we have, the document we have is not city speak. The document we have is kind of somewhere in between, right? Um, but it's important for us to be clear of what we're talking about, both that it's understandable and that it's specific, right? So that was the ways that we massaged the document. These were the interests that I insisted on for the group as they tweaked it and tried to, to bring some of these ideas to life. First was respect for the community ideas. Some of them people looked at and they're like, yeah, this is illegal. I'm like, yeah, but maybe somebody has a creative way to make it legal. I don't know, leave it on the list, <laughs> okay? So there were some ideas that were like, oh, I don't actually know what that would mean. Well, let's let them figure it out then, right? So it, respecting your ideas and the, the spirit that you brought them with was key. The second one is clarity, that we know what we're talking about and that we're really clear on that. It's a hard one to balance. The last one is a variety of options. So sometimes there was an idea that could have a bunch of different flavors. It's like, well, it could mean this or it could mean that. And there's different degrees of implementation. So that's the other one is I wanted to give you choices where you might have suggested one thing, but there are other ways that it might look. So for example, one suggestion was allow for more diverse housing types. So what I have underlined there were other specific ideas that came up. Um, and you can see how they got translated into some of your specific options. Revising code to allow for ADUs, revising code for single room occupancy, allow for missing middle types, um, which I'll define as the duplexes and triplexes and cottage clusters and those kind of things. Um, you can see the variety, 3A, is do that missing middle stuff, but in single family zones, all, all across single family zones. Another way is it, that it could look is do that, but along major corridors. Right? So there's a difference of what that would look like if you made those code changes. So that was one idea. It had overlap with other ideas, but you can see how it got expanded. Here's another one. People said make infill easier. 
great idea. What does it actually mean? How do you actually do that? So again, we came up with, um, you could revise the land use code to allow for more ADUs. Um, you could revise the land use code to ease development standards for adaptive reuse. You could replace code with a form-based code. That would be a different way that infill might be made easier. Or you could revise the land uh, use appeal process. Again, there was overlap. What you saw underlined was another point from a poster. Um, but these were all different flavors of how infill might be made easier. Any questions about how you went from how we went from the initial list of ideas to the giant? now colorful document <laughs> in front of you. We want to be transparent about how that changed and why. All right, so with that, if there are ideas that you feel like got dropped off and you have the photo notes, you can double check. Or if there was an idea that was really important to you and you don't see it reflected somewhere in there specifically, let us know and we'll add it back in. It was not intentional. We have the city staff, by the way, you have spent hours <laughs> massaging this document and I would write back and be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and they would write back really patiently and I'd say, I still don't understand what that means. <laughs> so they have put in hours on this document. Um, it's commendable. Um, if something got missed or mixed up, it's not intentional. <laughs> Let us know. We'll put it back in and try and get clear about it. You'll also notice there are some ideas that have a check mark by them. Those were new ideas that through conversation came up. And I said, uh, how do we add that back in? But if it's an idea that staff wants to talk to council about, staff wants to put out there to their leadership, I figured it's a good idea to pass it through you all and see what you think. You might look at those and be like, no, terrible idea, vote it down. Or you might say, oh, that sounds smart. I'm glad we have that to consider. Okay, so those ones with check marks did not initially start from the working group. But as they thought about ways to implement some of the other things or meet some of your other interests, they were ideas that came up. All right. Any other questions about those? Whew. Awesome. So to remind us, our end goal is to go from that full list of how many did we end up with in the end? 50 something <coughs> options? <laughs> Plus the ones that you can make add today. And ultimately, we want to kind of sort it into ideas that we have a unanimous agreement around. I still believe in that. I think we're going to get there. All the way down to ones where we have no agreement. Less than half of us think it's a good idea. So we can send it to council and say, do it if you want. But the working group had less than half of you agreed with it. Okay? And with each of those where we don't have unanimous agreement, we'll have the arguments of why that's a good idea, what interests it meets, as well as kind of the minority report or the arguments against it, and why folks um, have reservations about it. Again, agreement partial agreement. Yeah. Find again, agreement and partial agreement. Yeah, those are in your handbook. I don't remember the page number, but we can find it pretty quickly. Um, if somebody is faster than I am with their handbook and has a number, I believe it is on page, yeah, 10 and 11. So 10 is the values of reaching a decision by consensus and behaviors to help you get there. 11, specifically 11.3, define some of those thresholds. Separate from the numbers, I'd encourage you to spend time thinking about what consensus means, the content on page 11. It means we've listened to all the ideas, we've considered all the perspectives, even if a solution is imperfect, it's the, the results of our best thinking. Okay. Um, and so you can see some of those other details there. Again, if you don't agree with something, if you don't like something, if it doesn't meet your interests, you can stand firm in that, right? But be mindful of the tensions and trade-offs, right, of what, what you're giving up in prioritizing certain things over the other, and that's fine. Right? You, don't, you don't have to feel bullied into being agreeable just because I'm fun and you want to be agreeable. All right. uh, any questions about the consensus and where we're going? This will be more important at our next meeting, but we're, um, we're moving in that direction, so it's good to be aware. All right, I think then, without further ado, we are ready to talk about the market. Um, as Sarah is coming up, I want to tell you that Sarah is with us from the Bay Area. San Francisco? Okay, San Francisco specifically. Um, she um, has been hired by the city to do the full economic analysis and recommendations for this project. If you remember our context over here, 
we are, you are the working group, we are the working group, and you are making your recommendations to council. Sarah's firm, Strategic Economics, is also giving in information to council um, that will be very, very thorough and um, comprehensive. We have this permeable membrane because we want you to learn from the information expertise that she brings in, right? And you can decide what to do with that information. But she's here today to um, give us a, a sense of the market in Eugene, um, but also then address some of the other questions that you all had. So we'll be hearing from her throughout the night. Sarah, take it away. So, hello, everyone. Your mic's not on. I gotcha. Sorry. There you go. Okay. Now, can everyone hear me? Hold it closer yeah. to your mouth. Okay. <laughs> um, so, my name is Sarah Graham, and I work with a firm called Strategic Economics. We're an urban economics consulting firm. The firm's actually based out of Berkeley but I live in San Francisco. But um, regardless, we're working with the city of Eugene to conduct economic analysis to support this process and also to provide uh, recommendations to council in December. So we are um, evaluating a couple of specific tools for the council, and that is the ADU and the CET, or Construction Excise Tax. We're in the middle of that evaluation right now, so I don't have final results to give to you tonight. But I have some you know, preliminary observations, and we've also been collecting other information in support of your process here. So um, tonight, I will be covering a lot of information in not a lot of time. So. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of technical information, and I don't mind if you ask questions, but we do have a lot of information to get through. I'm going to provide you with quite a bit of quantitative data on demographics, on the market for real estate here in Eugene, data on housing and the need for affordable housing. And I'm also going to provide you with qualitative information that we have gleaned from interviews with developers and other practitioners in housing here in Eugene and also researching best practices from other places and um, tools. So this, all of this data is intended to provide you with context and background information for your process. And I know that you have some criteria. Carrie talked about um, the criteria that you've worked out, but I wanted to also give you a little bit of information about some other criteria that we think about when we're evaluating housing tools for communities. And um, so things that we think about are the effectiveness of the tool. How impactful would this tool be? Does it match the priorities of your community, the policies of your community? And market considerations. Does this tool, would this approach actually work under current market conditions in your community or, or potential future market conditions? Timeline, how long will it take for this to actually have an impact? And also um, staff resources or other financial resources needed to implement the tool. So those are just things to keep in the back of your mind. Um, while we're talking today. Um, so the information that I'm providing tonight hopefully will help you think through those things and I have a couple other notes to start off before I even get into the data. Um, I know you have a long list of options and tools that you're thinking about and I think probably the most important thing that I'll say tonight is there is no single solution that will solve the problem that you're tackling and that the most effective approach will be a comprehensive and strategic approach. A lot of the tools that we're talking about tonight will be most effective in conjunction with other tools. And many of the tools will have limited effect in isolation. So some of them might have some impact if it's the only thing you do, but a lot of them will do very little on their own. Uh, so that comprehensive approach to housing is really critical. Another in, um, note I, like that that I wanted to mention is that housing affordable is really a regional problem. It's not isolated to Eugene. 
So one of the things that I'm going to show you tonight is data that shows Eugene in context of the county or in context of Oregon or comparing you to some other select cities in Oregon to get an idea of where Eugene stands um, compared to other places, other neighbors. Um, so, I'm going to start off by talking about who needs housing in Eugene. And some of you may be pretty familiar with demographics in Eugene, but I know not everybody is, and this is technical information, so I'm going to explain <laughs> the slide. Um, and I have a number of technical slides that I'm going to try to get through. So, again, I'm happy to answer questions as we go through. If something doesn't make sense or you want clarification, just please raise your hand. So on um, this slide, this slide shows household comp You're going to provide them, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll put them on the um, shared website so people want to delve into this. Yeah, so if I go buy something too fast, it'll be in the, in the um, document that you get. So what is shown here is the household composition um, for Eugene, Lane County, and Oregon. And household composition is the type of household. Eugene is the orange bar here, and we have four types of households uh, represented in the communities. Um, a couple things to note on this slide is, well, first of all, did I say Eugene's the orange bar? I think one thing that's really interesting is that um, other non-family households and people living alone are, a, are significantly there's significantly more representation of those household types in Eugene than in Lane County or Oregon. And in fact, a third of households in Eugene are singles. A third of households in Eugene are made up by householders living alone. That's more than families with children. It's about a quarter of households are families with children. So there are more households of people living alone. Um, Age is not shown on this slide, but I think it's interesting to think about it in context with this slide. So um, compared to Lane County and Oregon as a whole, and you probably know this because of the University of Oregon, but Eugene has the highest share of 18 to 34-year-olds of any of those um, comparison places. So there are a lot of householders living alone, and there are a lot of people in the 18 to 34 year old category. And there are fewer people over 55 in Eugene compared to the county and compared to Oregon. And fewer children. So I'm going to move on unless there are any questions on this one. Okay. Um, this one shows um, income. And again, this is probably information that you may be familiar with. Folks um, have probably talked about this before, but Eugene has the highest share of the lowest income households earning under $25,000. So, in fact, almost a third of households in Eugene are earning less than $25,000 annually. And that's quite a, that share is quite a bit higher than in Lane County and Oregon as a whole. Um, so that's who lives in Eugene, and this shows what's getting built in Eugene. This uh, slide shows the housing units permitted over the last 10 years. And what it shows is kind of interesting. Um, the orange spike is apartment of, of five units or more. And as you can see, it really goes up to about 2014. And then it appears to drop off. And it's not going down to zero in 2017. We checked. That's 18 units last year were permitted. So. Um, Single family is the red line, and it's been kind of, you know, some little ups and downs, but it seems to, interestingly, it's really um, gone up quite a bit in the last couple of years as well. What's hard to see is the missing middle unit types, which are the ones we've been talking about as duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. That's the purple line that has um, really sort of stagnated there, um, never really going above 100, and in fact, dropping off in the last couple of years. And ADUs in, in particular had totally fallen off since 2015. So they had a little run and they fell to two or three or in the low digits the last couple of years. So that's what has been permitted in Eugene over the last 10 years. The fact is, is that today, 
housing in Eugene is largely made up of single family homes. About 55% of units are single family detached and an additional 6% uh, 6 are single family attached. Um, and then about a quarter of the units are apartments and the rest are those other types of units. So um, all that being true, of what I'm not showing here is the comparison to other places in Oregon. And it is true that Eugene has more diverse housing than most places in, in Oregon that we looked at. Probably not Portland, but yeah. So you said in 2017, only 18 units of multifamily housing was permitted? Have been permitted. And we checked on this today, and staff said that there may be some more coming in this year. We don't have 2018 data, I'm sorry to say. But, um, and, but yes, it was 18. And projects with five units or more. We double checked. <laughs> um, so moving on, this, this slide shows, and this one's a little hard to read, and I'm sorry for that, but I wanted to show median sales price um, by place in Eugene. And so you may have heard that the median sales price in Eugene for a, for a single family house is $315,000. Um, that is for all existing homes in Eugene. What this shows is the price is for newly built single family homes. So these are homes built since 2014, so over the last four years, um, that, and sales over the last year for those newer homes. And I'm gonna just let you know some of the prices here. So 97405, which is South Eugene, I should also caveat that the data is actually for homes in the borders of Eugene. Even though the zip code, the data comes by zip code, um, and that's how this map is displayed. Uh, the information is just for Eugene, it doesn't go up beyond the borders. But 97405 are the South Hills homes, the median sales price for a newly built home is $545,000. Um, 97401, or sort of central Eugene, the median sales price is $453,000. Uh, West Eugene, I'm calling it West Eugene, 97402, it's, it's pretty close to the median, it's $321,000. Um, North Eugene, or River Road, Santa Clara area, it's 386, so that's closer to those median prices. But some of these area, other areas, newly built homes are quite a bit higher. I don't have data on that, but I can, I mean, it is something we can add for next time. These are single family detached. Yeah. But I do have some data. Are there any other questions on the sales prices? Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question. Do you, uh, do you, oh, sorry, do you know by zip code how many homes yes, I have, have been in each of those? Yes, you and it's, I do have that. So, um, the, the numbers sort of correspond with the prices, so the areas that have built more homes, um, more or less, have the uh, prices closer to the median. So, um, the 97404, which is basically River Road, Santa Clara area, uh, the median sales price is 386. There were 81 homes sold over the last year, make up that number. But for example, 97405 in the South Hills, 16 homes, um, and the average was 545. So that's that's more or less the trend. The more the more homes have turned over, the closer to the median the price is. Any other questions on that? Okay. Yeah. How many in 97402? While we're on it, <laughs> um, 30. None of the numbers are huge, and these are not homes built in the last year. These are sales. Yeah. But those numbers. These are sales, newly constructed since 2014, but it's just the sales in the last. So it's the most recent sales prices that we could find. So moving on to uh, multifamily units. Um, this again, the data comes by zip code, which is not perfect. So please forgive the names that I applied to, your, to the neighborhood if it's not 
quite exactly what you would call them. Um, so uh, with no surprise, Central Eugene or 97401 has actually produced the greatest number of units. Um, and then West Eugene has uh, produced the second largest number of units. Um, and so I don't know if you can read this, but so Central Eugene has increased units since 2013 by 11%. For example, the university neighborhood has increased its units by 36%, but it started on a really much smaller base, so it's a lower number. Does that make sense? I'm going to show it with rents in a minute. Um, so this is looking at multifamily. Sorry, just to clarify. This is for all multifamily. Previous was single this family is homes. This multifamily units. Okay, thank you. Number of multifamily units. Um, and then this slide shows us those rents for multifamily units by zip code. So what's interesting about this data is um, the green band, again, is the overall amount that rent has increased since 2013. The, the rest is the total rent. So that average rent in Eugene is about $1,050 a month for every, everywhere. Um, but you can see it does vary a little bit by area. In central Eugene, it has, it's right, it's pretty close to that median, um, and it, it's increased about 17% um, over the last five years. But in some of the other areas, it's increased quite a bit more. Up in North Eugene, um, rents have increased 22%. In the River Road, Santa Clara area, rents have increased about 60%. It's included if it's multifamily. It's all multifamily. Or if students are living in single family homes, they would be, I mean, they're captured in that inventory the, as, as renters. Probably. Yeah, I don't have rent data for single family homes. Unfortunately, that's really hard to come by. Yeah. So what does this all mean? How affordable, and this is the small a affordable, not the designated affordable that we defined earlier, but how affordable is housing in Eugene? Um, we looked at that $315,000 median house, and it would require a household income of $62,000 to be able to afford that, and that's not really even talking about how long it takes to save up the down payment, et cetera but to pay the mortgage, um, it would take 60, an income of $62,000. And then for the median rent of about $1,000 per month, this is for the multifamily units, it would require an income of about $42,000 a month. And the median household income in Eugene is just about $45,000. And this is the median for all types of households. Um, just as a point of reference, those non-family households that I mentioned earlier, the median household for a non-family, um, the median income for a non-family household is much more like $25,000. So um, a non-family household would be quite a, quite a bit below these requirements for rent and for purchasing a home. Is this based on the concept that you Yeah, basically. So we use a, a little bit of a different standard for for sale for ownership products. So we typically, it's, it's the same basic premise. We use 30% for rental, that you shouldn't spend more than 30% of your income on your rent. But then we usually figure about 35% for home ownership because it's an investment and maybe folks can spend a little bit more on home ownership. But it's the same basic premise. Okay, and I think I'm way over my time, Carrie, so I'm gonna go fast. Um, I, I think a lot of you have seen this information before, but this slide shows rent burden in Eugene compared to Oregon, and the, the Eugene is here on the left. The green band are households that are spending 30% and more, or more of their income on rent. This is for renters, and it's 58% of households are spending that amount. And in fact, 36% of households in Eugene are spending more than 
of their income on rent. So that is severe um, rent burden. And it's quite a bit more than in Oregon as a whole. And how many affordable units are in Eugene? There's about 3,400 deed-restricted affordable units in Eugene. That accounts for 5% of Eugene's housing stock. So 5% of the housing units in Eugene are designated affordable. Uh, so, like I said, we talked to a number of developers and other people in the housing world, and what we heard over and over again were barriers to housing development in Eugene include construction costs, land costs, or scarcity of land, regulatory barriers to missing middle housing tops and, uh, types, and, and political or community barriers to housing. And I have to say this list is very similar to lists that I've made for other communities. So um, these are, um, you know, very expected barriers to hear about. Um, the scarcity of land and construction costs in particular. I'm about to wrap it up, but one of the things that has come up is how does Eugene compare to other cities? And I wouldn't say these are exactly comparable cities your comps in Eugene, but their um, neighbors or on the I-5 corridor or other mid um, cities in Eugene. And basically what we found is that Eugene has added um, population and housing units about in line with Salem and Springfield. You're growing at about the same rate as they are, adding population and housing units, um, and Bend is growing like leaps and bounds um, over the same period. Uh, a couple examples from other places of what has been the experience. These are bigger cities who have a different experience than Eugene, but in Portland and Seattle, people have asked, what about in Portland and Seattle? They're building all these units of multifamily housing. What's happening there? Um, in fact, in Portland, they have permitted over 40,000 apartment units since 2012 and rents peaked in 2016 and have since declined by about 9%. Um, also, you may know that last week, Portland area voters actually approved a $650 million bond measure to build thousands of homes affordable for low income residents. So that passed. Um, and then in Seattle, rents had been increasing dramatically over five years, they increased by 50%. Um, but starting last year, they did start to decline. And now there are reports that they may have overbuilt um, multifamily units in some neighborhoods that are considered hot market neighborhoods. Um, they've now, they're now seeing apartments that are not getting filled, they're not leasing up, and they're adding concessions to leases to try and attract renters. This is new information, though. It's not a settled matter, but that's what the news is saying about Seattle. Oh, that is the end of my slides, but I just wanted to say, um, just to sum it up, um, because I know that was kind of an avalanche of um, data, but I think that the takeaway is that based on the demographics and the economic data available on Eugene, and the housing composition here and what's getting built is that there's basically a mismatch between the demographics, the type of households that are present here in Eugene, and the type of housing that is available. So for example, one third of households are people living alone. It does the housing composition in Eugene provide appropriate units for one third of the households. Similarly, another third, there's probably some overlap, but there's a third of households that are earning less than $25,000 a year are, is the housing that's available, is the housing that is getting added to available housing, providing appropriate um, units for those households. So I'm uh, happy to answer any questions, but <laughs> I think we have to move on to. <laughs> Now, ah, is there a call that an avalanche of information? It's true, but that was the most orderly avalanche I've ever experienced. Anybody else? No? Okay. Um, thank you. Let's give a Sarah a round of applause. Uh, we
it is no easy task to make uh, information accessible, and there's still probably a whole bunch of questions, um, but just appreciate that. We'll be hearing from Sarah throughout the night, um, weighing in on each of the strategies um, as you guys go through them, and she'll be walking around to answer questions too. We want to be mindful of the, the solutions that you guys are going to land on don't, aren't just based on technical data, right? It's essentially how do these options align with your community values, right? Um, so we want information so you feel confident that the solutions will work and keeping in mind that ultimately even if something is super, super impactful, if it's not something you can live with, if it just goes against your community values, it doesn't matter what the data say, right? You're going to have a hard time supporting it. So we'll find the balance of those things. All right. So in just a sec here, we are going to get into some small groups to start uh, deliberating over, not just discussing, it's intentional, um, deliberating over some of the options that you received in your packet. Again, these are the expanded upon versions of the options that you brainstormed. I like to think of this as a all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> We're going to start with the breakfast course, which is strategy one. On that menu, there are a lot of options, right? Um, the idea behind it is removing land use um, code barriers so that you can increase the availability and, um, in some cases, the diversity of housing that's out there, seeing that as a strategy, a approach. Some of you might look at that already and be like, I hate breakfast. I'm skipping it. I'm going to lunch. I want to just invite you for each of these to think of this like trying it on. You're not committed. We're not going to force an omelet down you. Okay? Just try it out and say, what would be good about this? What would be drawbacks about it? Right? And as you do so, think, well, what, what would that egg actually look like? Or what would that omelet or what would that cinnamon roll, whatever it is, what would that actually look like? Um, so we can wrap our heads around it together. Some of you will be serving as translators. Those of you who are like experts in this field and this is what you do when you speak city speak already <laughs> um, can help as you have other people in the room that are like, I don't know what this thing means, right? Help me understand how this relates to my values. So thank you in advance for serving as kind of your interpreters to this. Um, all of us have an equal stake in this and all of us need to have an equal voice in saying, what solutions are, are most important, right? So thank you in advance for those of you who are well versed in this language for helping give voice to, to folks who have an equal stake in this but may not speak this language as fluently. I, I am in that camp. <laughs> I am still learning every day what these darn words mean. All right, so after strategy one, you'll go on to strategy two. Again, hey, this is what lunch looks like. What do you think of this approach generally? And then what do you think about the specifics? We'll talk about then strategy three, investing more funds in increasing the inventory of capital A affordable units. And everything else we're calling dessert. Those were some strategies that didn't fit within those other kind of broad categories. We're going to talk about dessert at the next meeting. Okay, so you're not going to have to get through all of them today. To do this, you will be working in small groups with a group of highly trained um, and really excellent volunteer facilitators. Um, they have uh, agreed to come and help out um, to help raise the level of your discussion, keep it balanced, keep it on track, um, and, and help you bring your voices to the conversation. Okay, so uh, we will thank them with rounding applause after you've gotten to know them. But here's what's going to happen. I need your help to rearrange the room a little bit. Your groups are going to have about eight people in them. Um, I'm going to tell you where those groups are going to be, have you help me rearrange the furniture, and then you're going to take a quick break so you can come back refreshed. Your name tags all have a star on them. Ignore all the other colors and markings and everything else. We had such a fiasco with printing name tags this time. Um, look for the star. Orange and red are hard to tell apart. If you're not sure, stand next to somebody else who looked like yours and try and figure out if it's orange or red. Okay? Sorry about that. Should have done purple or something. Um, that's going to be your group. Okay? Um, I'm going to tell you where you're going to go and I'm going to trust you and you design, builder, architect, or people to rearrange the furniture so you can get eight people around that spot. Okay? Trickling in, I'm going to give you a couple instructions to get you kicked off. We're going to hear from Sarah a quick blurb about strategy one, um, and then you're going to get to start with your small groups. Facilitators, I will post adjusted times 
um, for you, and I'll cue you when we're getting close to being done with strategy one. I'll apologize in advance. You could spend a day talking about each of these. Okay, it's going to feel faster than it ought to. We need to get understanding enough to understand kind of the pros and cons so you can feel comfortable voting. And it might be that you vote, we really need to talk about this one more and I need more information. That's fine. Okay. Um, your facilitators, can you give them a quick round of applause because they're awesome. <laughs> Who else volunteers? I sent out an email and they're like, yeah, I'll be there. Awesome. Um, we also have note takers. Big little round of applause for our note takers. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one volunteer note taker um, that we recruited and I'm super excited for. And then city staff are going to jump in too. Before, if you have any concerns about, oh, well, city staff, they've got their agenda and they're only going to write down their favorite ideas, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, they are professionals. Your votes will be tallied by your own paper. They're just going to kind of capture some of the conversation of um, the good stuff about the ideas, the, the drawbacks of some of the ideas, and the questions that you have. Okay? Um, and I trust them all with my life, so you should trust them too. Um, so your note takers are there. They're going to be capturing things. They might pause you so they can um, catch up sometimes. If you come up with new options today, your note takers are going to write those on cards and hold them up for me, and we'll add them to our list of things. All right, quick information from Sarah about strategy one, breakfast option, removing land use code barriers. Okay, um, is this one on? No. I, I'm afraid I don't. It's on, but hold it up to your mouth. Okay, great. Um, so we, I already went through the housing composition in Eugene, and I think that is a really important point uh, in regards to strategy one. So I just want to reiterate that currently Eugene is uh, predominantly single family housing. It's made up of mostly single family housing. Um, and and again, just reiterate that there seems to be a mismatch between the, the types of households that are present here in Eugene and the types of housing units that are available. And what we heard as far as it goes with land use code barriers from developers that we spoke with is that there seems to be, again, a mismatch between the um, tenants of Envision Eugene, the priorities, the things that are envisioned in um, documents for the city, and actually trying to get them out of the ground. That there is a vision of um, wanting diverse housing types, but in fact, when you get down to the land, use code, it is difficult to translate that into actually being able to build those other types of housing. So we heard the zoning code is too inflexible. We heard that planning priorities don't translate into enabling these diverse housing types. And we heard that in particular, ADU production is severely impacted by zoning language that is ambiguous. Um, and site design requirements that are illogical and arbitrary were words that were used, and, um, and that, in fact, there is a perception that some of the land use code around ADUs is prejudiced against renters. So the requirement that um, one of the units be owner-occupied specifically. So that's what we heard about land use code barriers to those types of um, housing. Perfect. That's it, yeah, for now. Awesome. So with that, you have information in your packet. These are the salmon colored options. Y'all are already on it. Um, I don't want to call it orange because I know what town we're in. It's the salmon option. Um, take a second to look at that information if it's still new to you. And facilitators, when you feel ready, um, jump in and enjoy. Oh, folks in the back, if you want to make your own small group and have this conversation, I would love for you to do it. Just be well behaved because there's nobody there to wrangle you if it gets out of control. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, go for it. So right now, if a property owner has been the land, I'm going to say removing the neighborhoods 
specific zoning is just a blanket thing is pretty it, 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 Yeah, that's no There may be a lesser version of that. Alright, let the person speaking now have the last word. And turn your attention back this way. I'll know you're ready when you're looking this way. I see Team Blue is ready to go. Team Black is ready to go. I think Team Red is reluctantly ready to go. Team Green is ready. Before we start on strategy three, raise your hand if you need like a whole lot more time to really get into the details. Good. Raise your hand if you also found where your group had some energy around things, whether it was energy in agreement or energy in disagreement. Both. <laughs> I I will say just from perusing, I have a couple tips. Um, one, I encourage you to continue to strive to balance participation. If you talked a lot on this previous round, sit back and be a really good listener on this next round. That doesn't mean you can't speak at all, right? But um, always seek to, to say what are the voices we're not hearing and how can we create more space for them. So one observation, because I heard a couple of your voices a little bit more than some of your other voices. Um, second bit before we go on. Uh, over here, we have a almost near replication of your strategies. Apologies for the gray, long story. These are all of the options listed in your salmon packet. These little sticky icons are based on Sarah and her team's analysis of what would be most impactful or least impactful. So I have a little key over here. The ones with the three smiley apples are ones that they say that would be impactful. If you chose to do it based on their uh, evaluation, it would be impactful. Ones with this face, are maybe fine ideas, but they would be a less impactful solution based on market forces or whatever else, okay? You might still love an idea that they say is less impactful, that's fine, it's your right, but this is their um, expertise and information. Ones that have an asterisk would be impactful if they were implemented with a comprehensive approach, okay? So in isolation, probably wouldn't do very well, um, but is a comprehensive approach could be very impactful. Um, number six, if you're keeping track, um, it would it would be hard to implement. It would be a very significant overhaul to this is the form based code. It would be a very heavy lift for something that compared to the other ones could have a greater impact. Okay. So um, other icons, I can read. You want me to read the ones that are super impactful? Yes. You want to know those? Yeah. Uh, so let me just tell you based on their analysis. Number one. Number three. Number four is an asterisk, impactful if. Number five. Number nine is impactful if, so an asterisk. And number 11. Ones that would be less impactful according to this analysis are number two and number six. It would be impactful, but it's a kind of a bang for your buck thing. Lots of work for, for the impact. Um, ones that have hearts or a different code. If it has a heart that's pink, it's already happening. The city's already doing it. You've got a code in there that indicates that. If it has a green heart, it's already happening, but it could be expanded. And those are the ones that have the city logo plus. All right. If you want to keep track, your paper ballot or your straw poll is in the back of your packet. If you want to be filling those in as you go, we'll have plenty of time at the end to do them. But if you want, it's kind of a beige color um, in the back. If you want to check some of your favorites based on the conversation just now, you can do so. All right. I know it's not enough time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's move on. Oh, I got a couple new options. Um, we'll add them to the mix at the end, but note takers, thank you for passing those along to me. Um, go ahead and pull out your yellow packets for strategy number two. We're gonna hear from Sarah. This is our lunch menu. Uh, we're gonna hear from Sarah about her thoughts um, from the Economist perspective on strategy number two. This one is about um, removing some or reducing some of those development costs to increase inventory that way. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. 
Um, so one of the things that I wanted to note in regards to this is we did not conduct a full uh, market analysis for Eugene that wasn't part of the study, but we did what I would call a, a market scan. So we showed you some of the information that we collected. We have talked to a number of developers. We've looked at market data. So I cannot give you a comprehensive market analysis right now, but I can tell you that it appears there is demand for housing in Eugene, and uh, um, no way. there are pretty low vacancy rates for a variety of housing types. So apartments and single family homes have relatively low vacancy rates right now. Um, rents have been increasing for multifamily, prices are going up for single family. There is demand for both types of, of housing. Um, and so as far as reducing cost and time burden for the development of housing, we heard specifically around costs um, that under the current conditions right now, under price, you know, prices, rents, and um, the cost for development, it's very difficult to make a reasonable return developing missing the, the types of housing we're calling missing middle. Housing. So we've heard from a number of developers that they have taken losses on this type of housing. They've, they've produced this type of housing and they've taken a loss in the past or they produced it and squeaked by. Um, the costs are not in line with the prices. So um, the permits for developing, specifically for developing townhomes, are taking too long and are too difficult. The planned unit development process has the potential to significantly delay pro uh, projects, and the appeals process adds delays and costs to multifamily um, projects. And we heard a lot about the SDCs for that system development charges. So these are the charges that the city um, puts to pay for infrastructure and facilities in the city. Those charges are not scaled to building size, so um, developers who are producing smaller units, they're producing ADUs, they're producing other types of units, are paying basically the same amount as a large lot single family unit. So that, that was a big thing that was raised to us, that those charges are not scaled to the size of unit or type of unit. So those were the babies. Awesome. So you have until 7.38 to dig into this one. No pressure, buddy. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> oh, wait. One question before we go on. John. So a lot of this is about SDCs. And um, I'm unclear about the city's ability to waive the SDCs. Right. So, um, so I don't know whether somebody can clarify that because if we go off and say, let's just wait all those things. Yeah. I don't think that's, I'm, I'm not an expert at it, but I don't think we can. Yeah, so this is a, a perfect example of um, trade-offs. Oops. Um, your explanation says SDCs are charged to pay for things like stormwater, um, what are the other things? Roads, Help me. Roads, Transportation, roads, roads, sidewalks, all that other stuff, right? So it's not just padding city budgets, it's that money is directly fueled to paying for these other services. So you'll see um, in strategy three, there's a lot of things that cost money, but could also bring in money. If you were to waive SDCs as one example of, of things in here, or adjust them or lower them, there would be a financial impact to the city that would have to be made up in some way. Okay, so that's a, a part of the conversation. Uh, this may help and how, if you want to support that, how might it mitigate those costs? Anything else to add? City staff, I'm looking at you, Scott, because you know most of these covered it. Okay, um, was that another, another question? Uh, on financial that? impact to the developers as well, not just the city. Of decreasing SDCs? Yeah, yeah, there's a capital improvement list that has to be paid for and if there's reductions on one end, the, the rest of the group has to make up for it. Okay, so another so, context yeah. piece that, that because of certain uh, expectations to make capital improvements, if those budgets were limited um, by implementing some of these, it would have effects in that way, that those, those costs would have to get made up for those capital improvements. Okay, good. Thanks for providing that context information. All right, dig in.
And turn your attention this way so I know your group is ready. I've got uh, one group ready. I've got two groups ready. I've got three groups ready. I have to say, y'all are doing an incredible job. The spirit of thoughtful conversation is remarkable. Almost unheard of in this country these days. I commend you. Well done. Um, I put up your icons here. If you want to know the uh, impactful ones, uh, we have marked 13 and 16, and also 18 impactful if. That's the if it was implemented as part of a comprehensive plan. So caveat on this, and I forgot, ones that are unmarked, they may be impactful, but they would need more study. So some of them may turn out not to be impactful, but it, they were ones that given the amount of time um, that Sarah and her team had, there, we, they weren't able to do a full comprehensive analysis of all of them. So for example, number 12 could be tremendously impactful. We don't know yet, okay? Um, so if it's something that's unmarked, it's possible that it could be impactful, but if there wasn't enough clear information to make a decision on it yet. Um, so I meant to include that in the last one, sorry. I didn't all right. Um, I think we're going to hear from Sarah about strategy four. I'm sorry, strategy three. Strategy three, working our way through the rainbow um, onto your green packets. Um, so a little bit of background information, and then you'll have time to work with your groups again. Uh, compliment yourselves, for real, the amount of listening and what I think I hear, and oh, I didn't know that. Um, this, the spirit of deliberation that we're really is remarkable, so I appreciate that as you launch into your last round. Go ahead. Okay, so strategy three is related to increasing the inventory of and access to the capital A affordable housing. Um, so I believe this is in relation to designated affordable housing. And I, I, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight there. We have already talked a little bit about what this means, what affordable housing means, but I just wanted to remind you that currently Eugene has about 3,400 designated affordable units. That accounts for about 5% of the total housing stock in Eugene. Um, and that, uh, for the most part, these units are designated for very low income households, for low and very low. So those are households with incomes under 50% of the area median income. And then when, we, when we've been talking to people, um, some items for us to talk through those conversations, things that we heard are, um, and things that are just a fact, are that um, federal funds for affordable housing have been declining for years. So the availability of federal funds is declining over time. Um, at the same time, construction costs for multifamily housing is increasing. And um, and we talked to a number of developers about the construction excise tax, just in general, and we heard a lot of concerns about that. Um, and the construction excise tax, to remind people, the revenue from that would be used for affordable housing, but it would apply to market rate housing. Um, but we, we heard a lot of concern that an additional tax may negatively impact project feasibility. We haven't looked at that yet. So that's something that we could do a quantitative analysis on, but we haven't completed that. Um, but developers did respond very favorably to um, incentives, to potential incentives for providing additional affordable units. So these would be tools like density bonuses or some other fee reductions or waivers or um, changes to things like parking requirements. So incentives were perceived as very positive, additional taxes were not. All right, with that then, this is your last round with these people, make it count. Strategy three, again, start globally with generally, what do you like about this idea, and then you can delve into the specifics. Um, appreciate I've gotten some new strategies or new options from folks. We'll, I will add those all up at the end, but we've got them. So pull number 20 with the caveat, but, right, if you're taking that money from somewhere, there would be 
impacts to that, right? So you could realign. One of the options was spend 50% of city budget on housing related things. That would be tremendous. I don't think we included that specific one, but that falls under this. It would be tremendously impactful, and there would be those trade-offs, right? Um, number 20C, a lot of the sub ones didn't get evaluated, but 20C did, um, and saying yes, bonds would be impactful. Uh, number 25 is an asterisk, impactful if. 26, impactful if. Again, that's as part of a comprehensive plan. 27, impactful if and 31 impactful. And you're still looking at uh, 20B. 20B, yeah, they're, they're doing analysis of the CET. And um, can I think, Sarah, can some information on that be ready at the next meeting? Yes. Yes, great. Some. Some. <laughs> awesome. Before we go on to uh, adding the new options, can you all take a big old breath and applaud your volunteer facilitators and note takers? Uh, I was tickled pink to get such a, a qualified and skilled group to um, jump in and then the staff's willingness to jump in as note takers as well as a tremendous resource, so thank you. We've got some really clear next steps that need to happen before the end of the night. I want to, we're going to walk through those and I just ask you to hang with me. Facilitators, if you need to jet, thank you people and just slip your way out if you want to stay and see how this lands with dot voting, etc. Stick around. Um, so we have some new options that have been suggested I'm gonna ask who can I get a non-biased volunteer to help me translate these two that just came in onto us post-it Leah thank you take the, this card and add it onto a, a green don't worry about a number I'll give it a, a number all right in your packets on the right side towards the back there's some kind of nice quality heavy-duty taupe colored paper Taupe? I don't know. I think that's a color. <laughs> um, there's a couple pages that, that is the where you'll do your straw polling of the existing options. What I need you to do now is find the one that's blank. It doesn't have any options filled in. It is blank. This is going to be a little bit messy, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me. This is a trade-off of, can you add more options? Yep. <laughs> can we consider them? Yep. These are brand new, it might be hard to vote on them, but I'd like you to write in that first little line on that blank page, 3C. 3C is enable more, so we had 3A and 3B, but this is 3C, enable more missing middle in green fills or large subdivisions. If you just write 3C, that's fine for me. You don't have to write the rest of the text, but if you want to remind yourself, option 3C, is about enabling more missing middle in green fills or large subdivisions. What is a green fill? Anybody? <laughs> Land with nothing on it. Okay, without contamination and so not hazardous waste sites. All right, that's not green fill. That's what, number seven A. Again, you can just write down in that next line seven A. 7A is a variation on 7, which was remove neighborhood-specific zoning, and this suggestion was review, evaluate, and adjust neighborhood zoning, neighborhood-specific zoning. If you want to go ahead and fill in your checkbox of like your gut feeling on how you feel about these, knowing that it's brand new and you may not know anything about it, you can. You can also check that middle box that says, I don't know. Um, 10A, rewrite the zoning code. Instead of scrap it, rewrite it. So the pieces of what that would be may include some of these other things, but saying it needs a, an overhaul, rewrite it. Anne's like, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, new option. Again, under the strategy, and this is number 50 because it's brand new and it comes after dessert just to keep us all straight. Number 50, add pre-approved ADU plans. So kind of create some plans that are pre-approved. I don't know what these mean either. <laughs> 
So take that for what it is, and at the next meeting, if there's enough oomph behind it, then people can fill in. Number 52. There is a 51. Number 52, mixed use on major streets. So mixed use being a mix of commercial and residential. John was just clarifying commercial on the ground floor, residential above, you can imagine that. What are you considering major street? Is it fair, I don't know who suggested that, is it fair to say the key corridors? Or do you want more than that? It wasn't my idea. I think it was more than that. More than the key corridors. Yeah. Okay. So more than key corridors, additional streets in addition, we would need to delve into some of those specifics it sounds like. All right, couple more. Number, this is now in the next chunk. These are the yellows. 12E, 12E, place a cap on the SDC waiver. So limiting how much can be waived. Again, there might be a bunch of nuance in these things that we'd have to work out if it was something you wanted to go forward with the next meeting. 12F, scale SDCs to size and impact of what's being built. So we have 12 is adjust it. 12F is like a sliding scale based on the amount of impact it has based on size and impact. And number 51, those of you that would or ANSI about 50 to 51 or 52. Change state law, S-U-P-T-E. I have no idea what that means. SUPTE? Single unit property It said SUPTE, but should it be MUPTE? No, it should be SUPTE. So all right, so this option, I have no idea what this means. Change state law for SUPTE. For single, for single family property tax exemption. For single family property tax exemption. So this is another one that is dependent on changing state law, but, but your uh, folks in the city could advocate for that. All right, last couple, 20E. This is, this is just an idea process-wise. The idea is to rank the sub options. So start with one of them, start with the most popular best one, and then depending on how that goes, implement the next one, okay? So I don't know that that's an option we need to vote on. I, essentially, it's kind of like uh, ranked voting um, for elections, so you, People would say these. Let's let's do them in this order. These are my top priorities. So you might start with one, and then if that's not implementable or doesn't work out, then you go to the next choice. Yes. Okay. So it's kind of a process thing. I don't know that we need to vote on it because council can just see these are the most pop, most popular and decide how to implement them. But if you want to include that as a way to work through multiples of those under number 20, um, 20B. This is not, you don't have to write this one down, this is just FYI, this option 20B shifts the overall market priority for what should be built. So that was a, a point of information that people felt like was lost. That was one group one to clarify 20B that shifts the overall market priority for what should be built regardless of how you feel about that. Put that information out there. And 20B asterisks. I just have sliding scale. What is 20B with an asterisk? Is this a, an amendment on 20B? That would be a CDP as a sliding scale. Yes. Oh, right. A 20 is a CDP. Yeah. And you could do that. Okay. Yes. So is this really 20B or is it 20E? It's 20B. A refinement of 20B. A refinement of 20B. Okay. And. Oh, sorry. Got it. So another one, and we'll recopy it, um, is going to be 53, number 53, tiny homes and communities by revisiting land use codes. So uh, I was just checking to see that that didn't fit with something else. So something in land use code, changing land use code to make it easier, it sounds like, to uh, build tiny homes, tiny communities. Yeah, the closest yeah, we, we found something close. Yeah, but it wasn't quite right, okay? So 53 is amend the land use code to make it more possible. I think we have like smaller homes on smaller lots and stuff, but this would be a specific tiny homes, tiny communities as a specific option. Okay. For all the singles, there you go. Um, 
you now have the opportunity, and this isn't your last task, so don't think you do this and you get to go. But I will pass out chocolate during this part because you've done such a beautiful job of navigating the room zone. Um, you have now a complete ballot, although it's really just a straw poll. Our goal here is just to see which way is the wind blowing, right? I, for one, am grateful you don't have to make your final vote now because you need more time to digest a bunch of these options, right? But this is just to see generally which way is the wind blowing, having had this amount of time to chew on these. Can you support some of these things? And you say, yeah, it may not be perfect, it may not be my first choice, but yes, I support it. And you have your green thumbs up. So you're gonna go through your list and make your check marks there. And you want a check mark on every one of them? If you can, yes, it will make it much easier for me. Take a stand. Okay. If you're not sure, if you say, oh, I have some reservations, I need some more information, but I wouldn't block it with where we're at now. I'm not like so opposed to it that I would say, mm, I just can't live with it. It's worth some more discussion. I want to talk about it more. I couldn't draw my thumb sideways. I had no idea how to do that. I just couldn't figure it out. So that's yellow <laughs> sideways. <laughs> I am not Picasso at this time of night. All right, or last option, I'm struggling. I would need more conversation to even consider it. This also might mean, you could talk till the cows come home, I'm not gonna support it, okay? Um, but it's something that right now you're just really struggling, it does not seem like a good idea. You would have to be really convinced to support it. Again, not saying you couldn't change later, with deeper understanding. Take some time and go through and check those off. Limited dots on your paper, okay? I'd like you to take your green dots and put them on your favorite strategies. If you only got to have, I think you have nine, 12, 12 dots. If you only got to have 12 of these go forward, which 12 would you do? And if there are six that you just couldn't live with, um, eight that you just couldn't live with, where would you put those red dots? Uh, no, don't put them on those sheets. Okay. Sorry, oh, good question. Okay. Don't put them on your sheets. You're going to come up and put them on our sticky walls. Okay. Let me let me have folks' attention for this. These papers are stuck to the sticky wall through magic. Please be gentle. My magic is questionable, and I didn't want to gas you out by respraying them all. So, if you, for example, love option number one and you want to put a green dot up there, you're going to just come over here, stick it up there, just do so gently because it might fall down and we're going to try not to have a mess. Um, so you're going to spread them out through any of these options that you see up there. They can be new ones, they can be old ones, um, and it's just to give us a visual that will hopefully echo the trends that we see in your full ballot. Okay, so your full ballot is how we'll sort things for next time, um, but this is to give us a visual of where the energy of the group is at. And so the red other ones?
Auditing the process to be like, like one thing we came up with uh, one of the tools that all bring to our table was the idea that you need like a team lead on a project and that they handle basically you go to the team lead and then they distribute that information out. But actually having like a physical like a like a web like a central website where all the documents go, everybody puts all the documents there, and that's where they get pulled off and signed just like a one stop so everybody has a complete picture of what's going on. Because they're complaining that I definitely found in this is that the right hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing most of the time. Right. Well, no, here's what I mean. Right. Just there's so many like, property taxes. It's exactly the problem that they run down um, run down housing. You know, give people a way to have a tax increase so they can, you know, build their affordable houses. Right? So if you get a, a, a family... Yeah, but it wasn't that. explained very well when Rilla popped out. I was the one who said it in our day. Oh, okay, because I really didn't... Uh... No, no. It's like, okay, so we have the, what's now affordable housing, right? Thank you. 